Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll continue in our discussions on miracles, right? We gave it a theme, the miraculous, for this month. And I titled today's sermon, Walking in Miracles. Walking in Miracles. Uh, we're trusting God that by the time we are done um, with this series, each one here will be a moving miracle, right? Things will happen in you, for you, and through you. Things that held you back before will not be able to hold you back anymore. Things you feared before will lose their hold over you. In the name of Jesus. All right, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. We'll read from verse 14 to 21. And we should have it on the screen now. So, as we usually do, we'll read together. One, two, go. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son. He said, he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. All right. So, experiencing the miraculous, there's a verse that I didn't put there, but I will mention it as I go on, right? As we go on in these teachings, um, the reason we are doing it is to remind each one that you cannot be with God and be ordinary. You cannot be with God and be like everybody else, right? It's, it's that simple. Um, so if you were in a boarding school, in high school, or you were in a school that was maybe not a boarding school, but was quite, uh, um, I don't know, where the training is quite plenty, if you know what I mean. You got bullied quite a bit and all of that. Now you probably have an idea of this. Um, I was one of those privileged ones that got picked on all the time, you know, because I my six pack did not did, um, develop on time, you know. But it took a while. Now I have more than six. But um, and so I would usually have people pick on me, but then I was also lucky enough to have um, some big cousin somewhere or some. I, I would just have them. And so in high school, I was in the boarding house, first year, second year. And when I got picked on uh, by the seniors who were, I wonder where they came from. Sometimes it looks like in boarding houses, the devil molds some people and sends them to school, right? And so, because when I think back now to the fact that we're all teenagers then, you wonder how mean some people could be, right? Anyways, so I always had them. Um, but then my dad's friend had kids in the school who were way older and very strong too. So they became my school fathers, two of them, very strong guys. I could never be that strong, so I knew that if I got to SS3 and some young boy depended on me to do that for the child, the guy was just gone. That's I, well, so I had these guys and um, they would fight for me from time to time. A senior bullies me, they'll go hit the senior and all that and my courage increased. Right? I could now do things and walk into certain spaces because they were, they, were, they were quite diligent. And so the end of the story is that when they were in their final year, I was in my second year, and it just makes sense that we graduated together. It's simple. When they graduated in SS3, I didn't go back to that school. We had to graduate. There was no way, because if I had not graduated that year, I would not be here today. 
there were too many people waiting for me, <laughs> right? But that was the gist. That they couldn't pick on me in those times was not because of me. It was because of who I was with. And as long as I was with them, I was untouchable. And when we got to the point where I could no longer be with them, I was very touchable. <laughs> right? And so I had to run for my life. My father never knew why I left, but it was we just kept, you know, my, my older sister was so fantastic. She, she took the case to him, and instead of talking, she just started crying. You know, it's a gift. When, when someone says, I'm coming to meet you now, and I'll cry. So you say yes. And then they cry, and when you eventually say yes, the tears dry up. It has to be a gift. And uh, she had it. And so she helped me. But the point I'm making is, when you are with someone, it shows. Especially when you are with God. If you say you are a Christian, and you come to church on Sunday when you could as well be sleeping, and you carry a Bible, and you shun certain things because of your faith, then it's got to show. People who don't do the things you do cannot come and meet you and say, these are the things I'm going through, these are the problems I have year in, year out, and your response is, my brother, you're not alone. And then you know that competition we do, the suffering competition. When someone says, oh, my life has been bad, you say, you don't know anything. My life has been worse. You know? I've not eaten in two days. You say, I've not eaten in two years. And then we begin to compete like that. There's something wrong somewhere. If you are with God, then certain things should change. And that's why we are teaching this series. The expectation, as you saw in that story, is not just that you will walk in miracles. It is that through you, God will work miracles. Someone say amen. That God would be able to lay it on people's hearts when they pray and say, go and meet Tola. He has a word for you. He can pray for you. In some cases, just a hug and someone feels strengthened. There are many ways God wants to reach people and we are the ones called by his name and he expects us to be the channels that he will use. And so in that story that we read, Jesus had come back from the mountain. He had um, those three apostles with him, Peter, James, and John, and then he had come, and according to Mark 9, which is Mark's rendition of that story, he came and he met an argument. People were dragging, you know, and he was wondering what was going on. And so they reported to him that this child has been having seizures. The parents brought him, and the disciples could not do anything about it. And so that was the reality met on ground, meaning that the people that brought the child expected that these people would be able to do something. And imagine the quarrels were along the lines of, but you say you are with Jesus. What kind of followers are you? People are not serious. That's why you're always eating. I noticed and all that. And all of that commotion was going on. And so Jesus got there and said, how long will I be with you guys? What's all this embarrassment? And bring the child to me, you know, and then he healed the child. And then the Bible explains that at the end of that story, the disciples went to meet Jesus to say, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we heal him? And reading through that scripture, reading through scripture in general, has opened my eyes to the fact that there are certain um, principles, laws, that we must pay attention to, uh, to walk in the fullness of what Christ has for us. To walk in the miraculous, there are certain things that we must pay attention to. Okay? Bible says we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. You have to follow principles. There are certain things that are non-negotiable. And today, I want to mention them. Just four laws that I wrote here that I trust that God will use to speak to us and help us. The first one is the law of connection. The law of connection. I started this teaching by saying that who you are with will determine what you do. And the first thing Jesus said in rebuking these people when he got back was, how long will I be with you? In other words, my being with you is supposed to produce something. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, 
Bible says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they knew that they were unlearned and untrained men, they marveled. Then they realized they had been with Jesus. Okay? It's the law of connection. You must spend time with him if you are going to walk in his realm. Let's face it. When something is a miracle to us, it is not a miracle to God. It's a miracle to us because it is way beyond our understanding, way beyond our processes. That's it. That's the way it works. I do not expect that when everybody was shouting, wow, look at this wine, and it came from water and all of that, I do not think that God was also shouting, wow, amazing. You did it. I don't think so. Because he can do everything. Right? He can do all things. So it is not a miracle in his realm. It is in our realm because it's different from what we've always known. And so if you are going to walk in that plane where things can happen, where people are saying there's a casting down and you are consistently saying there's a lifting up and you're not saying it as a motivational speaker, you're saying it from a place of deep faith and conviction. And I have nothing against motivational speakers, I should say. Because I, I, I see a, a lot of... Um, a lot of... Uh, what stray bullets that touch them, but well, those guys do a very important job. Sometimes you don't know, <laughs> okay, um, that they have a word to say to you when you are down. It's priceless. Of course, some will now add something else to it, right? Like somebody said <laughs> that, uh, as someone said, I started my chicken business with a feather. You know. Uh, that one is a problem right? yeah. but other than that the whole idea of saying you are more than this you are bigger than this you can go for it it's not bad in any way right? so please cut them some slack anyway what I'm saying is that when your pronouncements are different from what most people are saying and it comes from a place of deep conviction it is often because you have spent time with God. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible tells us that Jesus picked some people to be his disciples, and in verse 14, he gave us the reason. He said that they might be with him. That's the first thing. And then that he might send them out to preach, second. And then number three, that they may have power to cast out demons. That's the process, that they must be with him first. And we have to pay attention to it. To walk in the miraculous, you must be with God. We say it all the time. You cannot just say, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church. You must have a personal relationship with God and spend time with him. And that cannot be delegated. Okay? Daniel 11.32. He says, they that know their God. Custom made. Their God will be strong and do exploits. They that know their God. And why am I emphasizing their God, their God? Because to one person is prince of peace. To the other person is man of war. Same God, depending on your situation. Okay? Is the lamb of God. Is the lion of Judah. Is he a lion or a lamb? It depends on where you need him. And it's often a function of personal revelation that comes from spending time with him. Who is he to you in this moment? That's very important. A Christian must be able to spend time with God. There has to be that connection. So much as he loves your service in church and loves your giving, it's your heart first. It's that time first. Sometimes the the things we have issues with, you know, that we try to deal with, would fizzle out by themselves if you spend time with God. At days when you just have that good time of fellowship and at the end of it, you feel light. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. You just feel light. Nothing has changed outside. The economy remains the same. Your bank account remains, you just have this peace. Like the Bible says, that surpasses all under Even you can't understand it. You just know that's where you are, and that's where you want to be. 
The law of connection demands that we connect, spend time with God if we are to walk in the miraculous. And I, I, I wrote a few practical steps here that may help, you know, because, yes, it's a busy world now. I was reading a book in the course of the week, and um, the, the author was explaining that, yeah, I mean, the idea of consecration and moving away to be with God, most of those books have been written by monks who spend all their time in the monastery. So when people read it, when you that works in a bank, you, um, the doctor, the engineer, when you read it, it doesn't seem to apply to you because this person that wrote it lives in church, right? And so it doesn't fit your own reality. And I'd never seen it that way because many times I, I would begin to feel like maybe I'm not as devoted as I hoped to be because this person spends all their time, you know, but there are ways we can do it. One of it is to set prayer alarms, right? That your phone beeps at certain periods. The Bible explains to us that Daniel would go pray to God four times a day. So much that his enemies knew his schedule. Right? And so you can set prayer alarms. Say nine, twelve. When you take a five minute break, just talk to God and love on him. Something, you know. Yes, we are busy. Everyone's busy. When you want to walk in the miraculous, something's got to give. And I understand that not many of us are able to do the two hours, three hours prayers. Some people are never able to do it until there's a problem. You know? And then they'll they will prescribe it for themselves. Okay? But just set that. 9 a.m., 12 noon, 3 p.m., something. You know? Set prayer alarms. Um, another way you can do it is carry a verse with you through the day. You read your Bible in the morning. A verse of the scripture jumps at you. Write it down. Screenshot it. Something. You know? And at intervals, read it again. It gives you something to meditate on. Okay? It makes that word get more and more inside of you. If you have the space to do this, um, keep, keep worship music going on. You know? Especially maybe you work from home, you have your space and all of that, right? If you don't work from home, you work in an office and it's not allowed, and you do it. It's not persecution. It's prosecution, right? But keep, keep these things going, things that keep you, you know, in connection with God. Very important. Of course, I don't need to mention the fact that you need to read God's word, right? <laughs> you need to read God's word. You need to pray and all of that. It's very, very important, the law of connection. The second one is the law of exchange. The law of exchange. And this is close to the first one that I talked about. Because to connect, there's got to be some exchange. There's got to be some giving up for that relationship. Okay? And it's important that as we desire a close relationship with God, we must be willing to let some things go. It's just what it is. The verse down that Matthew 14, Jesus said to his disciples, but this kind only goes by prayer and fasting, right? And you usually ask, okay, so from my reading of that story, Jesus wasn't fasting when he did it. And he didn't pray when he did it. Because the, the, the concept is, it's not when you get to the battlefield, you then go and look for the weapon. You know? You, you just find out that you are seeing white, white, white everywhere. You know? You've gone. Yes. So, that's not the time. You, you build up ammunition and build up skill before the battle comes. It's the way it works. Right? That's why someone said, if you pray when you are in trouble, if you pray only when you are in trouble, you are in trouble. Okay? So you've got to strengthen yourself. So when Jesus said to them, this kind only goes by prayer and fasting, he's talking about the fact that there must be times when we, like Paul said, put our bodies under subjection and say, I'm going to be more conscious of the spirit than my body. And so your body is crying for food. 
and there are many people here like that. Normally, they will beg you to eat breakfast. No. Your first meal is around 3, 4. The day you say you want to fast, 6 a.m., hunger will wake you up and say, hey, go and eat. And so, six hours begins to feel like six years. People are passing. They are looking like rice. You know? <laughs> yes, it happens. But that's your body saying to you, you've got to listen to me. And you should then respond, no, I'm going to fight this through because of what I'm trying to do. In some cases, we say, yes, it's not enough to fast and not pray. Um, you don't get stronger by what you don't do, but by what you do. But on the other hand, the message there is, I will not listen to you for this purpose. Right? And to be able to put your body under subjection, it's very important to work in the miraculous. The days when you finish that prayer and you're feeling very strong in God, and the first person you meet, it looks like Satan sent them. I don't know if that has happened to you before. Like, like they came for you. It's a test. Right? And so you, at that time, have to insist. This is the reality I'm going with, not this one. There has to be that exchange. When you pray, your mind is going everywhere. There are things you want to do. There are things you need to do. And it is you saying, no, in this moment, it is me and God, not me and this thing. And so, building that connection with God requires some exchange. So, I've talked about spiritual practices, praying, fasting, and all of that. Forgiving is one of them. Someone's done something, and you don't even want to hear of that person's existence. And when you're feeling very strong in God, then the person shows up and you are required to show love in that moment. It's a spiritual practice. It's an exchange that God wants. And so we must be able to... So Jesus was telling them, these are the things that will bring out this kind of thing. It's an exchange. It keeps you more in my presence. And so when they bring this kind of situations, whether I'm physically there or not, you can use my spirit actively. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, whoever wants to be with me must first deny himself, carry his cross and follow me, right? And so there has to be that level of self-denial. Saying, like John said in John 3, 30, he must increase and I must decrease. There has to be that. To say I want to walk in the miraculous and I'm close to God, but then this thing I want to do, even God cannot stop me. <laughs> You know, there are those of us that are very good at putting Jesus aside. Let's, let's put God aside. As big as he is, you pick him and put him aside. Wow. Someone said those that put everything in God's hand will see God's hand in everything. Okay? And so there is no academic life and career life and spiritual life. No. For the believer, all of life is spiritual. God is involved in everything. Except you're saying he's not smart enough. <laughs> he's involved in everything. And we must always be willing to let go of self and let God take center stage for that relationship to thrive. A law of exchange must work. The next one, the law of progressive faith. The law of progressive faith. And this, I'll try to explain it um, as best as I can. It might be a bit technical. Jesus said to his disciples that it was a lack of faith that made them not able to do it. And then he promised to them. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, be removed from here, cast into the sea, and, and all of that. But then you look at the story this way. When they brought that boy to them, and they said, okay, we'll do it. That was some faith, right? Don't you think so? Because they had the option of saying, just wait for Jesus to come. He has not trained us in this one. Right? <laughs> and so, he just confirmed, is Jesus you're looking for, right? Wait, he will come. 
This is beyond our pay grade. But, but they attempted it. And that tells you there was some faith there. You know, so much that they were disappointed at the end that they went to him to say, so why couldn't we do it? And so it means that they had some faith. And Jesus said if they had faith as a mustard seed, which Matthew 13 explains to us is one of the smallest seeds. I mean, some of us have seen it. Then you get a bit confused because you're saying their faith should at least have been as small as mustard seed, right? And Jesus said that was all it took to move mountains. But then you read in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul was writing about love and was saying, oh, if I do this but I don't have love, it profits me nothing and all that. In verse 2 he said, if I had all faith so that I can move mountains, right? All faith. I think I have because of great faith or something. So that I can move mountains. And so you wonder, if Jesus said it takes mustard seed faith to move mountains, and Paul is saying it takes all faith. So which one exactly are we talking about? But the answer is in Matthew 13, I think verse 20. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which although being the smallest of seeds, it says when planted becomes the biggest of trees and birds can go rest in it. And so what Jesus was talking about was not just the size of the face, but in its capacity for growth. When you plant it, you use, it's like muscle. The more you use it, the more it expands. And so in other words, if you had not used your face for a headache before, you might not be able to use it for cancer. Because when this reality hits you, you cannot receive it. Your first response cannot be faith, except you had been using faith before. And that's the way it works. It's in its capacity to grow. And the question I have for everyone here is, what faith journey are you on at the moment? What are you doing that is way beyond you at the moment that you're trusting God for? I say life is in faces, men are in sizes. Your size depends on what you achieved before, what you conquered before. You then move to the next one and conquer, and then move to the next one and conquer. So what are you dealing with that is beyond you now? I heard a preacher say once that some of us take no risk, whether for ourselves or for God. The guy, he wasn't a nice preacher. And you see it when I finish saying what he said. He said that some of us live so gently so that we can arrive in hell in one piece. This is not nice, right? But I got the message there. Sometimes we are so careful and only doing things that we can handle. Never use that faith for anything. But I promise you, at some point, maybe this year, maybe next year, maybe next decade, at some point, life will ask you questions you cannot answer by yourself. Then you're stuck. So Jesus was saying to them, face as a mustard seed. Because the mustard seed does not remain that small once it's planted. It grows, does big things. And that's a challenge for you. Start doing something with the faith you have. Believe God for something. Stretch for something. A pastor would usually say that they say don't bite more than you can chew, but he likes to do that so that God can help him chew. <laughs> right? You, there has to be something beyond you that you try to do. And say, challenge I'd like to throw to someone here. Because faith grows. You use it, it yields, it grows. And then suddenly, things that you heard before and you freaked out, now you don't freak out about them anymore. Okay? Because, yes, your default response is faith. There are cases when something comes up and you want to stretch your face, but even you know that that faith is not inside. You know. You don't have the capacity for what you are trusting for. Right? Right? Because you haven't been exercising 
that phase. And so if you take any homework today, it is what will I stretch for in this phase of my life? What will I trust God for? How will I step out of the boat? Okay? That stretch. It's the law of progressive faith. If you are going to walk with God and walk in the miraculous, then you must be ready to step out. And then step out some more. And then step out some more. Right? And then the last one. The law of action. The law of action. I like to say that faith is an action word. Okay? If you have faith, it will show you your action. You know that book that we like to read, Acts of the Apostles? Yes. It's Acts of the Apostles. Not plans of the Apostles. Not deliberations of the Apostles. It's Acts. What they did. Luke started that book by writing, oh, this former account I wrote to you, Theophilus, and that was the book of Luke. He said, of the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Yes. If you have faith, it will show what you do. James talked about it in James 2. Okay, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. And then he explained, he said, faith without works. It's dead. If you have faith, we'll see it. Take action. Okay? Take action. Move. So I remember in, in the course of the week, a lady reached out to me. She had reached out to me a few times before. I think she lives in New, New Brunswick or something, in Nova Scotia. New Br one of those two. I don't know. I'm, I'm always mixing them up. It's not Calgary. Yeah. So, um, and so, she, so apparently she would do her church, and then on maybe Sunday evening or Monday, she would go watch PCG's service and said to me that some months ago, we had taught a series titled Outlook. I don't know if anyone remembers it because I did not until she said it. Um, but you should remember it. <laughs> okay. And that series was all about you looking beyond yourself, looking out, being a blessing to your world. The fact that God's given many things to you that will make the world a better place, right? And that you cannot just, um, you know, like they say, some people want to get all they can can all they get and sit on the can, right? That there's something beyond you. And so she said, listening to it, she felt God was telling her to take up singing again. You know? um, I think she had sang in a church choir back, back in Nigeria. Um, but I totally abandoned it and, and everything. So, uh, so she decided to pick it up. She had mentioned it to me a few times. And just last week, she told me that um, her first single had been released. You know, sent the song to me, told me she's getting a lot of testimonies already and all of that. Yeah, that's it. She's not even here. But she took a step. At the time she was going to start, I remember she reached out to me and said that she didn't know where to go with it, how to start. She had no idea what to do, but she was going to start. Last week, she sent me the song. Good song, actually. Very good song. Not because... It's a testimony. It's a very good song, right? But she moved. I think that people should come to church expecting to be pushed. People should come to church expecting to hear a word from God that will get them running. I think that people should come to church saying, Lord, speak to me and I will move in that direction. And you imagine that if you did that on the first Sunday of the year, and then the second Sunday, and the third Sunday, I don't know how many Sundays we've had this year, but your life would not remain the same. And that people should take church beyond, oh, it's a Sunday thing, and we are Christians because we are not Muslims. So, we just go and go back home, and we still do one for that day. Church is Mount Zion. The book of Hebrews describes it that way. He says it's the very presence of God, okay, where you have the company of innumerable angels, okay, where you see the blood of Jesus that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Obadiah 117 talks about that Mount Zion, 
says, For upon Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and holiness, and the house of Jacob will possess their possession. Psalm 84 7. It says, They go from strength to strength. Each one appeared before God in Zion. I am saying that church is not just a place for us to gather. And it's beautiful when we gather. It's lovely to see these beautiful faces and to catch up and to talk about what's going on. It's always beautiful, but there is more to it. God is there. The single most important factor that God is there and he speaks and deploys. Right? And so for us, church is not just what happens on Sunday. It's what happens on Monday, Monday to Saturday. And then we come back on Sunday and strengthen one another. And then we go make it happen again and come back. The testimony of church is that people ask you, how do you do these things you do? You know what? Wherever you go, Saturday, Sunday, I'm going with you. I want to hear what you hear. I want to see what you see. That's the testimony of church. Not my pastor is taller than your own. No. It's the fact that people see you and they know something is different. They know that there is something inside of you that is moving you in a good direction. And they want you to show them the way. See, in these end times, I, I, I think I've come to understand very well that the role of the pastor will be to coach, to strengthen. Ministry will not be done inside the four walls of the church. Is this four walls? Yeah, I think so. It, it won't be done in there. Ministry will be done out there, right? When people will see you not wearing suit, right? Not wearing tie, not carrying Bible in your hand, but they will want to be like, like you, and they will ask you questions, and then you will be the one to lead them. I, I, I had this protege back in Nigeria. <laughs> she, would, she would ask me for advice. I'll tell her, this is the way I think you should do it and all that. She would listen. And when I'm done, she'll say, yeah, you can say it to a pastor. <laughs> in her mind, it's a different life for pastors. And it's okay. Many people understand it that way. But in these last days, things will have to happen out there, not in here. I told the story of a popular singer in, in Nigeria that I had the pleasure of mentoring when she first gave her life to Christ. And she had this very interesting, you know, stage name that she was using for a long time. And so she came to me and said, oh, pity, I, now that I'm saved, I, I don't want to use that name anymore. So I said, okay, so what name would you like to use? She mentioned that name, a Yoruba name and all that. I said, if you try it, I'll, I, I, I won't say what I said. <laughs> well, so I said to her, I said, listen, that name you were using, there were certain places you went to that you were accepted, right? Certain people you talked to who listened to you. So now you gave your life to Christ. And you want to use your regular name like Tola City so that both of us can be dragging the same people I'm going to. Who will talk to those ones? So you will use that same name and go back and meet them. And so I remember in those days, she would chat me. It was Blackberry back then. She would chat me and say, Pity, I'm with my guys. I'm with my guys, I'm preaching to them. Give me scripture, give me scripture. And I'll text scriptures to her. And some 10 minutes later, she'll tell me, done, five souls saved, seven souls saved. I was the pastor. She was the one saving souls. Like she was, she was really, really doing it. Because where she was entering are places where pastors would not be received. And many of us pastors make that mistake, expecting that once they give their lives to Christ, they should now look like us and not be able to reach the people that we need to reach. But, but she did it very well. I encourage that. Keep your hairstyle the same. Keep your dressing the same. Everything the same. It's content that changes. But we see the example in Acts 9. When Jesus arrested Saul, Saul said, what should I do? He said, go to Damascus. Where was he going? Damascus. Go to the same place. 
It's just the message that is different now. The action in the last days is not in here. It's out there. Ephesians 4 talks about it. He said, we are all supposed to learn spiritual things. He said, so we all grow in faith. In verse 12 of Ephesians 4, he explains it. He said, the work of the pastor is to build up the saints for the work of the ministry. Some old translations will say, build up the saints, comma, do the work of ministry, right? And they separate it. A Bible scholar said that comma was not there originally, which means that the language there is build up the saints for the work of the ministry. It's the saints that will do the work of the ministry. And what's the work? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay? Matthew 5.16. That's it. To walk in the miraculous, you've got to stay close to God, be willing to make exchanges, and that's very important. Put your faith to work and build it gradually and take action. Do something. Do something. The earnest expectation of the creation awaits the manifestation of the sons of God. You, you, you belong to God. Let someone see it. Let someone see it. I remember when I was in, in the university, I, I invited a young lady in class to, to my fellowship. And she said, she said, I'll come. But first tell me what you scored in, we, we had done a test, you know. <laughs> so she said, tell me what you scored in the test. So I left her alone. Yes. It wasn't good at all. I got three over 20. So... So I just left her. I concluded that the Lord did not need her, you know. And so we got to, I think, 300 level or something. And she came to me and said, I, I want to come to your fellowship. You haven't been inviting me, you know. When, when she said it in my head, I thought, who would invite you? <laughs> you know. I got to find out, yeah, she knelt in front of me one day and said, pray for me. Something happened in all those four years, Right? And it's result. They say no result, no respect. No proof, no point. <laughs> okay? You, you don't just keep fighting and saying, no, I am this, I am. No. I think it was uh, Margaret Thatcher that said, being a leader is like being a woman. She said, the moment you have to say you are, then you are not. Right? I go to my house and I say, I'm the man of this house. And I say, there's something wrong with your beards. You still have to say, I am the man. There has to be something wrong. And, and then you tell your wife, I will show you that I am the man. But she married you. She, there's something wrong. When you have to tell your kids, I am the head of this home. And you have to remind them. There's something wrong. When you have to tell people all over the place, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. But when they backbite, you contribute. <laughs> you know? When people take what doesn't belong to them, you contribute. When everyone is sad and low and depressed, you top the chart. But then you've got to go back and tell them, I am a Christian. There's something wrong in that equation. To walk in the miraculous is to walk on a plane that most people don't. And of course, we have to live in a way that most people don't. Okay? And it's not compulsory for everyone, but if you are going to say, that's got to be my realm, then you must pay attention to these laws. The principles, you, you can't run away from them. Spending time with God, creating that connection, has to be there. Making exchange, giving up things for that relationship, it's got to be there that you can fast without coercion, that you can pray, you know, periodically go to God and, and talk to him, and not just to ask for things, but to know him more, that you can get on faith journeys and do things that are beyond you from time to time, and that you take action on the things God says to you. You cannot walk 
in miracles without following these laws. And just in case you say, well, it's not compulsory to walk in miracles. It's the expectation of God for you. I don't think that his main intention is to have more people going to church. That can't be all of it. It's for you to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And I just keep having that feeling that God wants us to get to the level where he will send people to us. Someone just comes and says, I don't know, but I just kept feeling like talking to you. And it's when they talk to you, they go back and say, now I know why. At what point are you going to become the answer to someone's prayer? The reason someone's life gets better. The reason someone gets closer to God. At what point is that going to happen? Or are you going to be the one that will make people say, if this is how church people are, I'm not going to church. If this is how Christians are, just leave me the way I am. You've got to choose. And I hope I've made it clear what God expects of all of us. Can we be on our feet as we pray this morning? The life God wants of us is not just one in which he blesses us. It's like he said to Abraham, I will bless you and make you a blessing. And I would usually describe it as being a funnel. You are the one passing oil. You can't be dry. Sometimes we are asking God to give us money. And it's not just thinking of what to give to you. It is what to give through you. But there is absolutely no way God will make you a channel of blessing. And you are not blessed. There's no way it will make you heal people when you are sick. There's no way it will make you encourage people and you stay in depression. There is more to your life than this. And people will keep bringing, you know, it's a symbol, their own version of sick children, sick issues. People will keep bringing them to you and they will come to you because you are the link they see to Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, you will not fail. In the name of Jesus, people will be talking to you. And as they are talking to you, the pain that they have will be disappearing. You will speak a word in due season to people. Without quoting scripture, your words will bring healing. Your words will bring peace. In the name of Jesus. Your results will show people that God is real. Your results will show people that God is good. In the name of Jesus. I'd like you to just lift your voice and talk to God in this moment. I don't know what part of that sermon felt like it was for you. But you want to tell God, Lord, I, I, I want to walk in the miraculous. I want to live in the miraculous. I want, I want to be one through whom you bless people and change people. Open my eyes, Lord, to what I need to do. I'm tired of living on this plane, just struggling for survival and not being significant. I want to be all that you want me to be. I want to live how you want me to live. I want to be a blessing indeed. Help me. Strengthen me. I want to be close to you, Lord. I want my heart to pant for you. The psalmist wrote, as the deer pants for the water brook, water brook, so my heart longs for you. It says, create in me a new heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Do not take me away from your presence. And I want you to make that cry to God in this moment. Say, Lord, I want you. I want you. In Mark 9, the father of that child, when Jesus said to him, do, do you believe I can do this? He said, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. In other words, I want to believe, but it's not strong enough. And someone here might want to say to God, I want to pray, but I'm not in that zone. Help me. I want to study your word, but I'm not in that zone. I want to live for you. I want, 
I want to please you. But I'm too weak for that right now. Help me. Help me. Jesus said to Peter, he said, the devil wants to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And I want you to pray to God and say to him, Lord, help me that my faith should not fail. Keep me strong. Strengthen me more and more. When I pick your word to read, let it open up to me. Let me see your mind. Let me know you for myself. Beyond what the pastor says. I want revelations in the knowledge of you. When I pray to you, Lord, let there be encounters. Lord, I cannot serve you and be dealing with the things I deal with. I want to walk with you. That these things may fall away. Strengthen my heart. Help me, Lord. I want to connect with you. Help me. That when it's time to make these exchanges for me to get closer to you, help me, Lord. You said I can't even come to you except you draw me, except the Father draws me. Draw me nearer, Lord. Friends, this this is a bigger prayer than Lord give me money. It's a bigger prayer than Lord give me a job. You're praying, Lord, help me to fulfill purpose. And you cannot be fulfilling purpose and be lacking. So talk to God and say, Lord, help me. Help me. And as I put my faith to work this week, strengthen me. Let it grow. Help me to attempt and to achieve things that were too big for me. And Lord, give me courage. Courage to act on the things you're saying. Because as we pray, I know that the Lord is painting pictures in certain hearts here. Something that you knew before, but you had let go of. And, and now God is putting it in your heart again. This thing that I want you to do. But you abandoned it because it seemed too big. And now as we are praying, God is bringing it back to your heart. And Lord, we receive your strength and your courage to pursue what you are putting in our hearts. Strengthen each one, Lord. Help us, Father. That these words will not be a waste in our lives. That these words will strengthen each one. Make us better. Some of us are fighting battles that are way beneath us. But it's because we are not setting our eyes on things above. Things bigger than us. But energy must go somewhere. And since we choose to look on little things, our energy goes there. Lord, help each one. That things that matter to us, that should not matter to believers, would not matter anymore. Help us to live for you. And to, to be blessings indeed. To turn lives around. To heal emotions. Heal physical pains. To strengthen people. To wipe tears from people's eyes. To be carriers of miracles. To change people's lives. We want to walk in miracles. Help us, Father. And let our lives be testimonies indeed. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we are grateful. Your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We're grateful because today your word has shown us how to move, where to go. But the Bible tells us that when the sower goes to sow seeds, the word of God, some fall into shallow grounds 
well received but lose their potency shortly after. And so, Father, I present the hearts of my brothers and sisters to you in this moment. Let these hearts be fertile grounds. Let your word grow in these hearts. In the name of Jesus. You said for some, after receiving the word with excitement, they go out and the cares of this world, the problems of life, and there are many of them, you say when those things come, they choke the word. Lord, I ask for each one here, each one watching online, that nothing will choke this word in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, that as your word is in our hearts, our faith will increase. Grant each one the capacity to act on the word. In the name of Jesus, whatever it is, whatever voice, that will speak to each one when we leave. And say that thing you want to do, that thing you believe God is leading you to do. Have you considered this factor? Have you considered this one? It's beyond you. Don't do it. Today, I silence that voice. We declare that when the enemy tries to speak, the voice of the Lord will be louder. In the name of Jesus. It says, when the enemy surrounds like a flood, the Lord will lift a standard against them. And I know that where the enemy fights his battle the most is in stealing God's word from your heart and putting weeds there. And over each one, under the sound of my voice, I declare he has lost that battle. Bible says, so mightily grew the word and prevailed. In your heart, the word of God will prevail. Indeed, you walk in the miraculous. It says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on us is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on us is loosed in heaven. Today, that word comes to pass in your life in the name of Jesus Jesus said, he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me because I always do the things that please him. The grace to do the things that please God, God gives to you today. In the name of Jesus. As you go into a new week, I declare a higher level of reasoning for you. Your mental capacity is increased. You think better than you thought before. Things that were stumbling blocks before you before, today I declare you rise above them. In this new week, the Lord will guide you. He says, your ears shall hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. I declare, this week you will not lack direction. This week you will not be overwhelmed. The psalmist wrote, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. This week you will know where to go. You will know what to do. In the name of Jesus. The word says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This week, the Lord will guide you. You will lack nothing good. In the name of Jesus. This week, when you go to God in prayers, the Holy Spirit will pray through you. You will find yourself saying things that are beyond you. You will receive instructions like never before. There will be faith in your heart to carry them out. In the name of Jesus. My heart reaches out to someone here who in the last few days has entered into an unusual level of depression. It would normally come and go, but in the last few days, it came very strong. And you are in this service today, but you are battling it big time. The Bible says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. Today, I declare, that the presence of God fills your heart. Depression flees. 
anxiety disappears in the name of Jesus. In place of anxiety, you have peace. In place of sorrow, you have joy. In the name of Jesus. As you go through this week, lines fall to you in pleasant places. You will call for one, ten will answer. God's word will come through in your life. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. Lord, we declare, as you make us teach on miracles, miracles must definitely give birth to testimonies. And in PCG, testimonies will be many. No one under the sound of my voice will be left out. In the name of Jesus. Let rejoicing be our portion. Let each heart be filled with joy. And let your name be glorified, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Can I hear a louder amen? amen. Hallelujah. All right, let's take a look.